Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second lecture uh, in Psychology 1000. Uh, and today we're going to continue talking about uh, the history of psychology, uh, and we're going to focus more on the 20th century, so more modern psychology, sort of psychology uh, as it is today. Uh, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, so we're talking about the more modern era, uh, so the 20th century into the 21st. Uh, and we'll be talking about things like cognitive psychology, and this is a, a big part of the second half of your first chapter. Uh, and cognitive psychology is very much alive. Uh, so we've talked about some historical points of view, uh, and a lot of those have sort of sort of fallen by the wayside. Um, new methods, uh, new ways of framing the problem, perhaps better ways of explaining psychological phenomena. Uh, but cognitive psychology uh, sort of supplanted behaviorism, as we'll see, uh, and, and kept some of behaviorism's positive points, uh, but updated the methods and, and updated the thinking uh, so that it could be a little more comprehensive. Uh, we'll also talk about social and cultural psychology, which are also relatively new phenomena within the field. Uh, and these, of course, deal with other people. Uh, so humans are social animals. Uh, we depend on social interaction to a large degree. Uh, but social interaction has its, its pros and cons. It can be uh, very complex, very hard to navigate. Uh, and, of course, not all interactions are positive. Uh, but in the end, we are social beings, and we are cultural beings. Uh, everyone is embedded in their own culture, whether we think about it or not. And we'll talk about culture being a more complex phenomenon than we usually think of it being. Uh, and then finally, we'll wrap up today talking about the profession of psychology. Uh, we've talked about a few famous psychologists over the last few centuries. Um, a lot of them weren't doing only psychology, for example. Uh, some were also physicists, philosophers. Uh, but now, uh, psychology is such a big field, not only is it hard to be anything in addition to psychologist, you also have to be specialized. Uh, psychology, there's, there's so much to the field uh, that you can't try and do it all. And so we'll talk about different professions in psychology. Uh, so in this session, what we're going to do uh, is understand what cognitive psychology is, but also why it came to be. Uh, it's going to be, a, as we'll see, sort of a response to behaviorism. Uh, again, keeping a lot of the positive qualities, uh, but also updating it and making it a little more comprehensive. Uh, it turns out there are many things about behaviorism that aren't particularly satisfying, both in a psychological sense, personally, uh, but also in a scientific one. Uh, we're also, when we get to social and cultural psychology, uh, going to talk about human beings from a social standpoint. Uh, so we've talked about the inner workings of the mental, of the mental processes. Uh, and, of course, there's also a very rich external world that we're embedded in. It's not just a collection and sequence of simple stimuli. Uh, people represent a very important but complex stimulus. Uh, and so there's a whole area of psychology built around dealing with other people. Uh, and then we're going to talk about those other professions in psychology and, and learn how many different roles there are, different ways of approaching psychology, different ways of employing psychology. Uh, and, of course, there are even lots of people that work in other fields that depend or interact with psychology uh, at, at a variety of levels to get their jobs done, even if they aren't, strictly speaking, psychologists. Uh, okay, so last time we ended by talking about uh, an increase in the scientific process among psychologists, uh, but also an increase in, in the school of thought known as behaviorism. Uh, and of course, behaviorism, the most famous proponent being B.F. Skinner, uh, who was a, a great scientist and contributed a lot to psychology. I'm not here to diminish his contributions. Um, but behaviorism isn't perfect. Uh, no school of thought on psychology is perfect. Uh, and so behaviorism had some, had some drawbacks. Uh, most importantly, if we recall, behaviorism uh, revolves around the idea that we're just trying to map environmental stimuli onto behavioral responses. So we take the world around us and predict what the person's going to do uh, based on what stimuli they're receiving. Uh, and so behaviorism in many ways denies the importance of internal experience. 
and not just subjective experience, um, things like feelings and, and consciousness, which are very hard to quantify, uh, but all sorts of inner experiences, things like subjective perception, uh, certain forms of memory, for example. Uh, and then so behaviorism, again, in, in an effort to be simple and to be tractable, to be doable uh, in a scientific setting, uh, sort of cast aside some important parts uh, of psychological function. And I say important here not just to mean that they're important to us, that we think of them as being important to our lives, uh, but they also uh, turned out to be important in terms of explaining behavior. Uh, and so behaviorism is very much about learning, right? Preparing uh, an environmental stimulus, the response, getting reinforcement uh, that either increases or decreases the likelihood of, of making that behavior again. Uh, and behaviorism really can't explain everything. Uh, and it can't explain some kinds of learning, as we'll see when it comes to things like language, uh, that even if a child has not heard a particular sentence before, uh, or has never generated a particular sentence before, they can still do so, uh, even though they haven't been exposed to that particular stimulus. They can still generate new sentences, understand new sentences. Uh, and of course, that's just an example from language. Uh, there are also certain forms of learning that are faster than others. Uh, and behaviorism itself can't explain that. Uh, right? So behaviorism, all forms of learning should be equal uh, if the stimuli are about equal and the reinforcement is about equal. But it turns out certain forms of learning are easier than others. Uh, and behaviorism couldn't address that. And so that needs to be updated. Uh, so it also ignores the influence of evolution. One of the reasons that certain forms of learning are easier than others uh, is due to evolution. So for, your book gives the example uh, of animals that learn to pair uh, foods with the experience of nausea and learn to avoid those foods. And they learn that quicker than if a light or a sound is paired with nausea. And the way that's usually done is by introducing some sort of toxin, not enough to kill the animal, uh, but enough to make it nauseous. Uh, now, under behaviorism, those, should, those forms of learning should be equally quick. It doesn't matter whether it's a taste stimulus, food, uh, or a light, or a sound. Uh, if it's paired with the same nausea, that is the same reinforcement, uh, then the animal should learn equally quickly. But it turns out that animals learn a lot more quickly with regard to food, if food is the stimulus that's paired with nausea, uh, than if light is the stimulus. And the reason is that nausea is, is often a result of ingesting something poisonous. Uh, and of course, ingesting something poisonous is going to be associated with food uh, in a way that it wouldn't be associated with a flash of light. Um, in the natural world, there's really not, not really a way, a good way for uh, a light to induce nausea. There's other ways to induce nausea, things like motion. Uh, but the most common way is food. And so that is, that is an evol that's part of our evolutionary history. Our, an our ancestors learned by example uh, that food can be associated, associated with nausea. They didn't learn that light could. Uh, and so that, that sort of pairing uh, is kind of innate. We talked the last time about uh, Plato and nativism, the idea that we're born with certain kinds of innate knowledge. Uh, and while the knowledge itself wouldn't be innate in this case, uh, our capacity to learn is innate. And we're more prone to learn about food and nausea together than about light and nausea. Uh, so the response to this was the rise of what we call cognitive psychology. Uh, and so cognitive psychology, the, the word cognitive, uh, relates to cognition, thinking, uh, internal mental processes. Uh, and so what cognitive psychology did was it retained the good parts of behaviorism uh, and while adding on some things uh, the behaviorism was lacking. Uh, so it retained an emphasis on experiment, on measurement, uh, and so that was one of the one of the best qualities of behaviorism. Uh, it wasn't a collection of, of introspections. Uh, you did experiments, you measured things quantifiably. Uh, but what cognitive psychology also did was it acknowledged the existence and the importance of those internal mental processes, things like cognition, uh, things like consciousness, attention, 
Uh, and then these are things that behaviorism had, had perhaps not denied explicitly, but certainly had downplayed. Uh, but as it turns out, these are important parts of our cognitive world, important parts of our psychology. And without them, we can't really explain a lot of behavior very well. So things like perception. So not just the stimuli that are coming in. As it turns out, uh, our internal experience of a stimulus may not match all that well to what the stimulus is literally out in the world. And we'll talk more about that here on the next slide. Uh, memory. And of course, memory is built into behaviorism in the form of learning. Uh, but the subjective experience of memory, the fact that memory is not a perfect record uh, of what one has experienced, so that is an important part of cognitive psychology. Uh, the ability to reason, uh, to think logically, to forecast consequences, uh, whether perfectly or not, uh, that's an important part of cognition. And so it became a part of cognitive psychology. Uh, okay, but before we get to full-fledged cognitive psychology, uh, there are a couple of influences on the discipline uh, that need to be mentioned. They are themselves not, strictly speaking, cognitive psychology, uh, but they helped inform the discipline. They helped shape it uh, in those early years. Uh, and one of these is Gestalt psychology. Uh, gestalt is a, is a German word, uh, meaning taking things as a whole. Uh, as opposed to what, what we call the reductionist approach. Uh, and we can see some of the reductionist approach in things like structuralism, uh, which tried to, uh, to break down consciousness into its smallest components. Uh, and the whole idea of Gestalt psychology is that perhaps that is not the best approach or even a viable approach, uh, that by breaking things down into uh, components, you, you miss uh, some important part of psychological function. Uh, the whole is more than the sum of its parts, uh, is, is, is a good summary of this, of this sentiment. Uh, so by bringing things down into the simplest possible stimuli, uh, you're not really describing things at the level that we experience them. And a lot of this work was done by looking at perceptual errors and illusions. Uh, so you have the literal stimulus, uh, often a visual stimulus, but for whatever reason, the participant doesn't experience the stimulus in terms of what it literally consists of. So if you look at this figure on the right, this is from your book, it's a famous figure, uh, it's hard not to subjectively experience uh, this white triangle that's sort of tilted to the right, uh, but this white triangle that's on top of uh, a, a dark outline triangle and three circles. That's what we perceive. Uh, but of course, literally, that white triangle isn't there. We only infer it from what's happening in the rest of the figure. So what the, what the figure literally consists of uh, is three sort of less than signs and three Pac-Man-like symbols. Uh, so that's what, what the, the figure literally is, uh, but it's hard not to see that white triangle there. Uh, and it turns out, as people move on to, moved on to studying the brain, uh, that part of your visual system uh, infers these sorts of shapes. When your visual system sees something like this figure, uh, the simplest explanation is not these sort of weird less than signs, Pac-Man symbols. Uh, the simplest explanation is circles, simpler shapes, and, an ex and a whole triangle being occluded, being covered up by this white triangle. And so your visual system tries to come up with the simplest explanation for a three-dimensional world. Uh, rather than what literally the stimuli are. Uh, and so there are lots of illusions and errors that we make. Your book mentions one uh, in which a series of flashing lights uh, makes it look like there's a moving light, as opposed to what the stimulus actually is, which is two separate lights flashing in sequence. That's not what people perceive subjectively. Uh, and so that, that really emphasized the importance of subjective perception. Uh, and so there was also an increased emphasis on real-world stimuli. Uh, a lot of psychology had been, had been done with simple stimuli, which is good, uh, but stimuli that don't really represent the world we live in. Uh, and of course, we evolved, not literally into the world we live in, the world we live in is fairly new, uh, but we evolved in a world that's really complex. So using simple stimuli in a sterile environment may not be 
it may, it may not give us the most insight into how our mental processes work. Uh, and here, expectations have a big effect. Uh, so, for example, in memory experiments, uh, using simple word or non nonsense stimuli, uh, you, you get a fairly reliable set of results. People are able to regenerate their mental their experience from the experiment. Uh, but when you start introducing a real-world stimuli, now people don't have expectations about nonsense syllables because they don't experience them that much. Uh, but when you're talking about real-world events, you ask someone to remember uh, an event as it happened to them. Well, now you start to build in expectations. Uh, people have expectations about how things occur in the real world. Uh, and so when they try to relate what's happened to them, you often see errors that crop up that wouldn't have cropped up under these novel nonsense stimuli that the person has no experience with. Uh, and so when you ask them to recollect a life event, that recollection is often inaccurate. Uh, it can be influenced by previous expectations. Uh, it can be influenced by things that happened afterwards. It can be influenced by the way you ask the question. Uh, there's a famous experiment in which people are shown uh, a video of a collision between two cars and are asked to recall if there was broken glass or not, uh, or asked to estimate how fast the cars were moving. Uh, but it turns out the way you ask the question matters. So if you ask how fast the cars were going when they bumped into each other, uh, people don't remember broken glass. They, rec they recall the speed being pretty low. If you asked how fast the cars were going when they crashed into each other, people report a higher speed, even though they've seen the exact same video, the same stimulus. But because of the way you've asked the question, it alters the person's expectations. It alters what they recall. Uh, child development was also an influence uh, on cognitive psychology. And Jean Piaget uh, was pr is perhaps the most famous developmental psychologist. Uh, and it's a fairly recent one. His work was fairly recent. And so uh, what he noticed was that cognitive abilities appear in children at different times in the lifespan. Uh, that at first, and this isn't just things like language or walking, we all, we already knew that. Uh, but, for example, if you give, I believe, I believe your book uses the example of a lump of clay, uh, but often it's typically a glass of water. Uh, and if you split the clay or the water uh, among different containers, you start with one, contain one big container, one big lump of clay, and you split it up, uh, and you can ask the child if there's more or less of the material afterwards, uh, young children will report that there's a different amount now. They don't have the idea of conservation of mass. Uh, and so they don't, they don't understand yet that just by breaking up an object into smaller parts doesn't change the total amount of material that there is. Now, that's just one example. There are also things like what we call theory of mind, uh, where when you ask small children uh, what somebody else believes, they can't conceive of somebody else having different beliefs than they do. Uh, if the child knows something that another person doesn't, uh, the child thinks the other person knows it too. Uh, they can't think of other people as having their own beliefs uh, separate from their own, having, uh, having personal information uh, that only they are aware of. Uh, also things like object permanence. So if an object like a toy uh, goes behind another object where the child can't see it, very small children won't look for it. They don't know that it's there. It'll be a surprise when the object shows up again. After they get a little bit older, they know that the object hasn't disappeared. That it, they know that it still exists. Uh, they just know that it's hidden behind another object. And that's a developmental stage. It takes a while to learn that. Uh, and so these different cognitive abilities showing up at different times uh, suggested that rather than being a, a collection of stimuli and responses, uh, that children really do develop different cognitive mechanisms as they age. So that was an important step as well, that the idea that cognition develops. Uh, we've already seen a little bit about this with the effect of expectations, but subjective experience and context are important. Uh, so it's not just, again, a set of stimuli and responses. Uh, the context of the person, the person's previous experience matter. Uh, so, for example, you can't tickle yourself. So even though it's the same stimulus on your skin, when you're being tickled by another person, 
it depends on the person, of course, your response will be different from person to person, but also different between that person and trying to do it to yourself, uh, even though it's the same stimulus on your skin. So context matters. Subjective experience matters. Expectation matters. And these all help shape cognitive psychology into what it is today. Uh, another big development was uh, the rise of computers. Uh, and this happened post-World War II. So World War II saw a, a, the advent uh, of computers, of computing. Uh, and in that post-World War II world, uh, computing really took off. And of course, computers are a very important part of our lives now. Uh, you're in fact taking this online class, so you're obviously on a computer. Uh, and, and that was important for psychology, uh, certainly in a practical way. That's important for much of the world, and certainly psychology in a practical way. Uh, insofar as, as computers help us record data, they store data for us, uh, they allow us to analyze the data, to uh, run statistics on even very large data sets, uh, and certain measurement techniques wouldn't be possible uh, without computers. We'll talk more about different methods uh, in the next unit, uh, but a lot of these methods depend on the presence of computers. So that's the, the practical impact of computers on psychology and cognitive psychology. Uh, but there was also a conceptual impact. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, computers process information. They store information. They can produce output. And those are a lot of the same psychological functions that we possess. Uh, so computers gave us a new frame of reference, a new way of thinking about the processing of information. Uh, and so a lot of analogies were drawn between computers and the human brain, for example. The human brain takes in information to the senses, just like a computer takes in information from a disk or from some measuring device from the real world. Uh, it can store the information. We store it in memory. Computers have a memory also, chemically different, but conceptually very similar. Uh, and then we process that information. We manipulate it somehow. Uh, and then, of course, eventually we can produce an output. A computer produces, in the early days, a, a printout or an answer of some sort. Uh, nowadays, computers can produce all sorts of output, uh, especially if they are involved in robotics. You can actually have a behavioral output. So there are a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences that are important. Uh, and so both the similarities and the differences uh, helped inform cognitive psychology. So the way the computers store information physically uh, is different from how humans do, different from how the brain does, and not just humans, all organisms. Uh, and we're still discovering how the brain stores information, uh, but computer has, uh, computers have helped shape our thinking on the subject. Uh, also, how we take in information, how we perceive information, and it's a two-way street. Uh, there's a lot of work being done right now on computer vision, so helping computers to recognize a set of visual stimuli not just as a collection of dots or a collection of lines, of, of a collection of simple stimuli, but giving computers the ability to recognize objects the way we do. Uh, and this is something that we do effortlessly. So we, in fact, it's very tough for us to recognize a person's face, for example, as a collection of simple stimuli. We recognize the person in terms of their identity, uh, not just some dark spots and some white spots and some contrast lines. We recognize the person. Uh, and it's very difficult to break that person back down into the simple elements, uh, the simple visual elements that make them up. Whereas for a computer, that has to be programmed. You have to program a computer to recognize objects as they are, uh, and not just being a collection of simple visual components. Now that's just one big difference. There, there are more. Uh, but we see the disciplines of cognitive psychology and computer science overlapping quite a bit and informing one another. Uh, cognitive psychology also emphasizes human abilities and limitations. Uh, there are things we're good at. There are things we're not so good at. And behaviorism didn't really build that in, didn't really build in limitations uh, on learning, on the ability to process stimuli. But obviously we are limited. Uh, and there are some big thinkers in this area uh, as cognitive psychology was, uh, was on the rise. So Donald Broadbent, for example, uh, emphasized the limits of attention. Uh, he worked with, with pilots and radar operators uh, 
this is in the, the World War II and post World War II environment. Uh, and he, he recorded how you can't pay attention to everything at once. You have limited resources. You have things like fatigue. Uh, all this cognition takes energy, takes time. Uh, and you have limited cognitive resources for processing information. You can only pay attention to so many things at once. And uh, if you've heard of multitasking, people don't really multitask. You don't really pay attention to multiple things at once. Uh, what you do is switch your attention back and forth uh, between one task and another. That takes time. That takes effort. Uh, and Broadbent helped bring that to light. Uh, George Miller. You may have heard of the famous rule of 7 plus or minus 2. Uh, that's a, a description of how many things we can really keep in mind. So when you think of a phone number, you can remember, well, phone numbers used to be more conventionally seven digits. Now we often have to memorize area codes as well, but that's ten digits. So we have ten-digit digit dialing. Uh, and then that's getting toward the upper limit of how many digits a person can usually keep in mind. Uh, and you can increase that a little bit, and you can, and there's variance from person to person. Uh, but if phone numbers were 20 digits long, people would have a really hard time remembering that information long enough to dial the phone. Uh, and so George Miller emphasized the limits of what we call working memory. We'll get more to that in a few weeks. Uh, but our ability to retain information fresh in our minds has limits. We can only hold so much. Uh, and then you have people like Noam Chomsky, uh, who gave us insights into language. Uh, and so behaviorism, uh, again, has this idea that you learn purely through experience. Uh, and Chomsky said, well, wait a minute, that's not quite right, because you can generate entirely new content you never experienced before. Uh, what we really seem to do is have a set of internal rules that we learn. And then once we know those rules, then we've got all the possible combinations of meaning and words uh, that we can come up with. Uh, and so Chomsky was very much at the forefront of uh, of criticizing behaviorism and suggesting uh, that we needed to expand uh, our thinking on what cognition was, uh, expand the importance of cognition in psychology. Uh, and then as we get further into the 20th century, uh, we start seeing the development of neuroscience. Uh, and one of the first intersections between neuroscience and psychology uh, was behavioral neuroscience. And these terms can be a little confusing. I'm not going to make, it, make a big deal uh, of the difference between behavioral and cognitive neuroscience. Uh, but behavioral neuroscience uh, seeks to find the connection between psychological processes and the brain. So, for example, Carl Lashley was one of the first behavioral neuroscientists. Uh, and what he did was, perhaps fairly crude by today's standards, uh, but at the time was very important. Uh, he kind of built on Paul Broca's work, or if we recall, Paul Broca uh, was a physician who had patients, uh, one patient in particular, he was most famous for, that had suffered a brain injury, that were, was missing part of his brain, uh, and had lost the ability to speak. Uh, so what Lashley wanted to do was figure out what part of the brain is responsible for learning. And it turns out there is no one part of the brain that is responsible for learning. It, it requires a, a set of regions. Uh, but what Lashley did was he removed parts of the brain and looked at the effect on behavior. Uh, and that was really a big contribution. So being methodical, he was still using controlled experiments, not depending on accidents like Broca did, uh, but being very careful about which parts of the brain were damaged or removed, uh, and then measuring quantifiably uh, what changed about the individual's behavior. And here, this is working with animals. Uh, you can't remove parts of somebody's brain just to see what happens. That wouldn't be ethical. Now, of course, people lose parts of their brain due to accidents uh, all the time. Things like accidents, stroke, uh, cancer. Uh, and so these provide sort of accidental experiments. Uh, but Lashley was doing controlled experiments uh, in animals. Uh, to emphasize the importance of different regions of the brain uh, when it comes to behavior. Uh, and building on that, as we move into humans, we have cognitive neuroscience. So here we're linking those higher functions to brain activity. So not just to the, the structure of the brain, but actually looking at 
whether neurons are active or not, neurons being brain cells. Uh, where is the brain active? How is it active? When is it active? Uh, when somebody is thinking, when somebody is experiencing a feeling, uh, when somebody is trying to recognize an object. Uh, these are all cognitive processes, trying to remember something. Uh, and so looking at the connection between brain activity, not just brain structure, uh, but brain activity and cognitive processes. Uh, and here, the focus is really on humans. Some cognitive neuroscience uh, is done in animals, uh, especially uh, non-human primates like chimps and monkeys. Uh, but the focus is really on humans because, to our knowledge, there are capacities that only humans possess. Um, there are open questions as to the range of emotion that the animals experience, uh, their memory functions, uh, their ability to use language, for example. Uh, and there's certainly evidence that animals can do some of these things to certain degrees. But we know that humans do, uh, and especially when it comes to dysfunction, we are primarily interested in human brain function. Uh, and again, we can't go in cutting up brains and controlled experiments, so there, there's an emphasis on non-invasive techniques. Uh, and your book doesn't define what non-invasive means, but what non-invasive means is you're not cutting into the body. You are not introducing an implement into the body. You're not damaging brain tissue or other parts of the body. Uh, and so non-invasive generally means it doesn't harm the body in any way. The person will be the same after the experiment as they were before. Whereas things like lesion studies in animals where you damage part of the brain, the animal's not the same afterwards. Again, not ethical to do that to human beings. Uh, and so the emphasis is on non-invasive techniques. Here we see an image uh, of what's called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. Uh, and this is a non-invasive technique we'll talk about in a later unit. Uh, a non-invasive technique that looks at brain activity. It's able to measure brain activity without harming the brain itself. And this is actually a technique that I use in, in my research. It's become increasingly popular uh, since its discovery 25 years ago. Uh, but you can look at brain activity while a person is thinking about something, or feeling something, or making a decision, or trying to recall a memory. And so each of these is a different cognitive process, uh, and it causes a different pattern of activity in the brain. And so we can see, using a technique like this, what the relationship is between activity in a certain region, or at a certain time in the brain, and the cognitive process that it accompanies. Uh, another discipline that, that sort of came about at the same time as cognitive psychology <clears throat> is evolutionary psychology. Uh, and here, this is a, a looking at psychological processes uh, through the lens of evolution, much the way that William James did. It's sort of an update to his process. Uh, and here, the idea is that brain structure and brain function evolved through natural selection. Uh, so. Our, our bodies, the way our bodies are organized, uh, evolved by natural selection. Uh, and brain structure did there, you know, brain structure is part of our anatomy. Uh, and so if the brain evolved through natural selection, that means that the functions that the brain produces also evolve by natural selection. Uh, and so it, it sort of reiterates William James's idea of brain function and behavior uh, being adaptations. But these things evolve, our capacities evolve, uh, in order to help us survive. So some behaviors are more adapted than others, uh, and, some, and because behavior is produced by the brain, uh, the brain can evolve to produce these behaviors, uh, or at least make the behaviors more likely. Uh, adaptive, again, here means uh, increasing the likelihood of survival, so you adapt to your environment. Uh, over an individual time scale, but also an evolutionary time scale. Uh, and so as organisms behave, interact with their environment, some strategies are better than others. Uh, the ones that are really bad obviously don't survive to reproduce for the next generation. Uh, so the animals that are better at reproducing are those that produce behaviors that enable them to survive and reproduce.
Uh, so here the framework is to look at the mind and behavior uh, in terms of survival. What benefit uh, does this behavior confer? What benefit does this cognitive capacity give us? Uh, if, it, if it's not good for anything, then why do we have it? Why would we evolve it? And there are some evolutionary accidents, to be sure. Uh, but what we often see is a kind of trade-off. So you might think, well, uh, why, are, why aren't our brains better? Why don't we have bigger brains that can process more information? Why would we evolve something with these cognitive limits? Uh, remember, remember, memorizing seven pieces of information, that's not that many. So why would we have that limit if we, if we could just expand our brains and have a better capacity? Well, there's a trade-off. Uh, if you have a bigger brain, well, A, you have the weight of it to carry it around. That's going to take energy. You also have to take the energy to run it. So your, the brain is one of the most energetically expensive uh, organs in the body. The heart and liver, along with the brain, are the top three. The brain uses a lot of energy, considering it's only about three pounds of your body weight. Uh, and so if you had a bigger brain, you'd need to feed it even more energy. And that's energy that can't be used for other things. That's energy that you have to go out and find. Uh, and so evolution has made these trade-offs, has found these sort of compromise points between having an unlimited capacity and having to find unlimited resources or devote unlimited time to support those capacities. So they're sort of a happy medium, we think. Uh, so the question is, why would certain traits or behaviors evolve at all? Uh, when we see an interesting behavior, why do we have that in our behavioral repertoire? Uh, well, the most obvious is that it's a better response to a given stimulus. Uh, so your book uses the example of uh, mice and rats preferring, that is moving toward, uh, dark enclosed spaces. So, and you can test this behaviorally. There are uh, experimental setups where you give a mouse or a rat two options. It chooses between a, a giant op open, brightly lit space and a smaller dark enclosed space. Uh, and most of the time, the animal will choose the dark and closed space. Why? Why does it have that preference? Why does it behave in such a way uh, that it moves toward one space and not the other? Uh, well, because dark and closed spaces are more safe when it comes to predators. So a predator can't fit in a small space. It's hard, harder for a predator to see in the dark, perhaps. Uh, and so a small animal that's, that's otherwise vulnerable out in the open will evolve to prefer a dark and closed space. How does that happen? Uh, well, if you have a bunch of animals behaving randomly at the beginning, the ones that go out in the open get eaten. They don't get to reproduce. The ones that go into the dark and closed spaces, they get to survive to create the next generation of animals. Uh, and so over time, the preference, the strong preference for dark and closed spaces becomes genetically ingrained in the animal. Uh, and this has been reproduced in the laboratory uh, some with rodents, but, but certainly with animals with quick generation times, like flies. Uh, so you can breed flies to prefer either light or dark environments uh, because the generations are so quick, it only takes a matter of weeks. Uh, and so you can selectively breed animals to have certain traits, to exhibit certain behaviors. Certainly we've done that with things like dogs. Uh, so dogs are domesticated, we've bred them to exhibit certain behaviors. So there, humans are acting as sort of an artificial means of natural selection. We're letting some animals breed, others not. Uh, and so we're modifying what genes are present, what behaviors are present uh, in dogs. We've done it for lots of animals, but dogs are a good example. Uh, certain traits and behaviors evolve because it's the, so to speak, smart thing to do within a group. Uh, so one uh, example of very social animals uh, are, are humans, but in this example, I'm going to use bees. There are certain insects like wasps, bees, uh, termites, uh, that have a very regulated social hierarchy. Uh, each organism has a job to do. Uh, and bees, certain species of bees, uh, if they sting an individual, uh, they can't remove that stinger very easily. And, and oftentimes, a bee stinging an, an organ, another organism uh, results in the death of the bee. Uh, 
he might think, well, that runs up against our notion of evolution. Why would an animal evolve a behavior that kills itself? Uh, and the answer is that genetically, uh, a population evolves uh, sometimes at, 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 at that large genetic level. Genes don't care about a single individual, so the genes don't, strictly speaking, care about anything. Uh, but genes will sacrifice one individual if it means lots of copies of that gene survive in the other individual. So a behavior that might be damaging to an, a single individual uh, might actually be adaptive, might evolve to become prevalent, common, uh, if exhibiting that behavior helps the gene survive in the group. Uh, bees are very genetically related to one another, uh, and so a bee can sacrifice itself uh, if that sacrifice means that its genes survive in its relatives. Uh, so there are lots of examples of behaviors like this where uh, an animal will exhibit a behavior produced by its genes uh, that, that's self-destructive for the individual, or at least not helpful, uh, but that helps its relatives. And of course, some behaviors are accidental. They're, they're byproducts of the real consequences of, of, the, of the gene being present. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, faces are, are deemed to be more attractive by participants that are looking at pictures of faces uh, if the pupils are dilated. So the pupils are bigger, they rate the person as being more attractive, all other features of the person being the same. Uh, just a, a matter of photoshopping the person to have bigger pupils. So why is that? Uh, well, that is, is an unintended consequence, we think, uh, because when a person is in an aroused state, uh, whether they're scared, whether they're nervous, or whether they're sexually aroused, uh, one of the physiological consequences is pupil dilation. Pupil di dilated pupils help you take in more light, help you see stimuli better. Uh, but when people see those dilated pupils, it indicates the person is in a, that person is in an aroused state, uh, and people on average tend to find that attractive. Uh, and so that second consequence is it seems to be kind of a byproduct of this gene that causes pupils to dilate when the person's aroused. Uh, and, and so that's just one example of accidental consequences. There are lots of them, we think. Uh, but it's not, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that evolution has a goal in mind, uh, that it is sort of a direct process to a, a direct path to a benefit. Sometimes there are accidental byproducts. Uh, okay, switching gears a little bit to another modern form of psychology, uh, we have social and cultural psychology. Uh, and of course, these deal with other people, how we respond to others, how others respond to us. Uh, and as I've said before, human beings are inherently social. Uh, we need interaction with other people. Uh, and so what social psychology does uh, is examine this phenomenon, the importance of social interaction, uh, the nature of social interaction, how interaction works, what people respond to, how they respond to it. Uh, so it turns out social isolation is actually very damaging. Uh, Solitary confinement in the prison system uh, is, has a lot of negative long-term consequences that people weren't uh, originally aware of. And there's, a, there's also a big movement to, get a, to do away with solitary confinement as a punishment uh, because it has these long-term damaging effects. And so social interaction is a necessary part, uh, not just to survive as a practical matter in the world, but it is also in and of itself beneficial. Uh, there, there's a flip side to that coin, and that's the, the possibility of negative consequences to social interaction. So other people's behavior, uh, even other people's mere presence. So somebody that doesn't have to be doing something to influence us, just the fact that they're there can influence us. Uh, so we, we want to uh, seem like a good person to everyone. That can change our behavior. Uh, that can make us sometimes less honest. If you've ever, if you've ever told a white lie, that is a, an untruth, uh, that is a behavior that is ethically questionable, uh, but we do it for the sake of others. 
Uh, there are also a phenomena like conformity. And conformity has been studied a lot, uh, where you do the same thing that everyone else is doing, just because everyone else is doing it. You don't want to be the odd person out. Uh, you don't want to be different from other people. Uh, and that can be a problem uh, when other people are doing something unethical. A lot of this research came post-World War II when people were curious how something like Nazism could become so common when it's so obviously unethical. Uh, and the fact is, there was a big part to play on, uh, with conformity. So people were conforming to what the majority of the group was doing. Uh, and so a lot of research has been devoted to conformity, uh, to things like groupthink, uh, which is a phenomenon by which uh, a group will decide uh, on a poor course of action uh, because no one wants to disagree with the leader or wants to disagree with other people. That we have a, a, an inherent tendency to be agreeable, to not be a problem member of a group. And that can have benefits, but also can have real con negative consequences uh, when a group does something bad. Uh, so that's social psychology. There's also cultural psychology, which is a relatively new phenomenon. And so that looks at the effects of culture. Uh, and when we say culture, what often springs to mind uh, are cultures within our nation based on things like ethnicity, uh, but certainly differences between nationalities. Uh, so certainly Western European culture is different from East Asian culture. Uh, there are different rules for behavior. Uh, but we should not think of, of culture in so limited a fashion. Uh, culture, cultural differences exist between people of different socioeconomic statuses. So the well-educated versus the poorly educated, the wealthy versus the poor, uh, older and younger populations. So it's not just, and certainly uh, sex or gender-based culture. Uh, these are all ways of, of uh, that people separate themselves into groups. And, and these are different groups in which different cultures can arise. Uh, so this example here that we see in this picture uh, is from your book, and, and it looks at the differences between uh, economic classes. So showing that uh, wealthier individuals uh, tend to act more selfishly. And this, is, this example is from driving behavior, but it's true for lots of different kinds of behavior, uh, that wealthier individuals uh, tend to be more selfish than, than less wealthy individuals. And the thinking is that wealthy individuals can depend on their financial resources, whereas people that don't have as much money have to depend on each other. So there, uh, you have to be sort of a good citizen, so to speak. You have to be nice to other people. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to help you when you need it. Uh, and so the idea of culture transcends nationality, ethnicity. Uh, but a lot of cultural psychology is about behavior that's expected of you, uh, so norms, rules for behavior. Uh, and these things depend on context. So what sort of behaviors are appropriate in one culture may be very different from the behaviors that are appropriate in another. Uh, similarly, when it comes to clinical psychology, uh, the sort of symptoms that are emphasized in one culture may differ uh, from those in another culture, or behaviors that are deemed bizarre or detrimental, harmful, in one culture may be totally normal in another culture. And so the idea is that things like psychological disorders, uh, things like rules for behavior, social interaction, aren't necessarily universal. The culture has a big part to play here, and so we don't want to label behavior or, or norms as normal or abnormal without considering what culture a person is coming from. Now, all that being said, there are uh, certain things that are very common across cultures. Certain emotional expressions, for example, are very recognizable across cultures. Uh, symptoms of certain psychological disorders occur across cultures. So we don't want to adhere to total relativism, the idea that every culture is unique and is totally different from everybody in from every other culture, uh, but it's not the case that everybody is the same either. So there's a sort of balance again. Uh, okay, moving on to the modern profession of psychology. 
uh, there are lots of different ways to be a psychologist. Uh, so, for example, as your book mentions, uh, the APA, the American Psychological Association, uh, was established in the 19th century by William James and a handful of others. Uh, as time has progressed, uh, the APA has, and, and psychology has grown, the APA has expanded beyond academic psychology uh, to include clinical psychology, other forms of psychology, and that's great. Uh, there's a newer society that's re-emphasizing uh, academic and research psychology, and, and that is the APS, the American Psychological Society. Uh, but the idea here is not to memorize acronyms and dates of establishment. Uh, the point is that psychology has become a very big field, and so you have these organizations uh, that promote psychology, uh, that help to connect individuals to one another uh, within the field, because it's no longer just a handful of uh, people. Uh, also, as time has gone on, the membership of psychology has become increasingly diverse. Uh, so you have more women, more minorities involved in psychology. In fact, uh, the majority of people studying psychology are now women, as opposed to how it started, which was exclusively male. Uh, so, for example, very early in the 20th century, uh, the APA had its first woman president. Uh, and then later in the 20th century, 1970, uh, the APA had its first minority president. Uh, and so these are signs that the discipline of psychology is, is expanding, not just in terms of what it looks at, what it focuses on, uh, but in also who, is going to, who can be a psychologist, who wants to be a psychologist. Uh, and, and it's becoming a much more diverse field uh, as time goes on. And there are a lot of different ways to be a psychologist. There are a lot of different careers if you're interested in being one. Now, lots of people study psychology in college uh, and move on from there. Uh, it's, it can be useful knowledge to have. It's certainly interesting. Uh, if you want to be a career psychologist, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, so, for example, we've talked a lot about research. Uh, and research in psychology is certainly a big field. Uh, so, for example, if after being a psychology major or really any major, uh, you can move on to graduate school in psychology, get a PhD, uh, and do research in psychology for a living. Uh, there's also, of course, clinical psychology, which we talked about before. Uh, and clinical psychologists uh, are people that study psychological disorders. Uh, there's also psychiatry. Uh, and, and psychiatrists, of course, are people that are interested in psychology and treat patients, for example, uh, but they've also gone to med school. And so one important distinction there is that they're allowed to prescribe medication. Uh, and, and so psychiatrists are coming to psychology from a medical perspective, uh, are, are uh, looking at psychological disorders uh, from a physiological perspective. Uh, you also, of course, have uh, psychologists that aren't psychiatrists, uh, but are still interested in treating psychological disorders. You have therapists, for example, uh, that, that treat individuals not with medication, uh, but with behavioral therapy uh, by talking to them about their problems or talking about their symptoms uh, and trying to alleviate psychological disorders uh, that way. Uh, and psychology has gotten increasingly specialized as time has gone on. At the beginning, when you have people like William James, uh, James studied all aspects of psychology. You even had people who studied psychology and other disciplines like physics. Uh, but now, because it's such a big field and because we know so much more, it's very difficult to be well-versed and to study every area of psychology. You have to specialize. So maybe you study attention. Maybe you study memory. Maybe you study language. Uh, and these are all different fields of psychology that you can specialize in. Uh, but there are still other ways of being a psychologist. Uh, people who work in the field of psychology or interact with psychology in some way don't always refer to themselves as psychologists. Uh, but psychology has an important role to play in lots of fields. Uh, so, for example, medicine. We were just talking about psychiatry. Uh, and psychiatry, uh, psychiatric disorders uh, and represent a huge fraction of hospitalizations. So psychological disorders and their consequences 
uh, have a big part to play in medicine, especially preventive medicine. Chemistry. Uh, a lot of psychological disorders are treated with drugs. Uh, and so now you have chemistry involved in psychology. So you have a meeting point uh, in drug research. So the chemists need to develop the drugs, need to put the, the molecules together. Uh, and then psychologists uh, have to diagnose symptoms, figure out how effective a drug is, if it's effective at all. What symptoms does it alleviate? What side effects does it have? Uh, and those all require psychological measurement. Uh, ecology, that seems like a weird one. Uh, but uh, people interact with the environment, and people's subjective experience of the environment involves psychology. Uh, so where people want to live, uh, how people function with regard to sustainability. Uh, there are psychological processes involved here. People, again, have limited capacity. Uh, they don't always forecast the consequences of their actions all that well. Uh, and so short-sighted thinking uh, or selfish thinking. Uh, can influence the environment, can have a big impact on the environment. Uh, and of course, psychologists also do research uh, trying to figure out how to make people more environmental friendly, environmentally friendly, for example. How do you get people thinking about the environment? Uh, how do you get people to uh, engage in behaviors that are helpful for the environment and for others? Business. There's a whole field of psychology called industrial and organizational psychology. Uh, and this field looks at business, looks at industry, uh, and how organizations function. Some function better than others. Uh, and that can be a function of how they communicate. Uh, it can be a function of the personalities involved. Uh, but IO psychology looks at business and industry uh, and looks at it from a social perspective. It involves a lot of interacting people, sometimes with conflicting interests. How do you manage that conflict? Uh, how do you communicate effectively? And so business is heavily influenced by psychology. Economics. Uh, and of course, the, the world economy is a huge phenomenon, but it is composed at its most basic level of individual people making decisions. And now if you have people making decisions, that involves psychology. So how do people make decisions? How do people forecast consequences uh, of their economic decision making? Uh, so how do you save for retirement? How do you choose between consumer products? Uh, how do you interact with other people when it comes to money? Uh, and so economics is influenced by psychology. And economics is also influenced psychology. So uh, in my field, uh, we often look at decision making through an economic lens in terms of value. Uh, do people choose the most valuable option for themselves? Do they not? If they don't, why do they not? Uh, are there, is there a social influence at play? And so all of these different fields uh, influence and are influenced by psychology. Uh, okay, that will do it for this lecture. Uh, next time we're going to move on to the science behind psychology. Uh, so looking at methodology, and, and, and most basically, a psychology is based on the scientific method, at least modern psychology is. Uh, as we've seen, uh, science has an increasing role in psychology and psychology research. And so we'll talk about the scientific method and how it's applied to psychology. Uh, and that will, that will determine how do you design a, a psychology experiment? What makes a good experiment? What makes a not so good experiment? Uh, how do we really isolate the phenomenon that we're interested in? How do we measure it? How do we study it? Uh, and of course, once we run an experiment, then we've got the results, we have the data. What do we do with that? How do we analyze data? How do we understand data? How do we interpret it in a, in a meaningful way? How do we avoid over-interpreting it? We don't want data to tell us something that it can't actually tell us. Uh, and so how, are, how do we, in a principled fashion, analyze and understand the data that we get from psychology research? Uh, so that will be next time, and I will see you then.